and welcome to the Natural History Museum here in London. This is the Otumpa meteorite, a piece of space that fell to earth. And when I first came here as a small boy, I ran through the gallery to try and get close to it. I'm still impressed today. This programme is all about meteorites. We've come to see the museum's fantastic collection of space rocks and find out what we're still learning about them today. We'll bring you the latest on the Chelyabinsk impact in Russia and John Colshaw has been on a meteorite hunt of his own in Wiltshire. Pete and Paul have tips on what to see in this month's night sky and Chris North has something new, our first space surgery. Seeing any fireball falling to Earth is very special. Oh, wow! What a corker! Meteorites are essentially space rocks that are unlucky enough to collide with Earth. Last month, asteroid 2012 DA14 had a lucky escape, swinging past close enough for Sky at Night viewers to capture these amazing images. Most meteorites are small and the product of a collision between asteroids, resulting in millions of tiny, rocky fragments which float in space. Some get in our way, and then they burn up in the Earth's atmosphere, sometimes creating a fireball, and sometimes landing on Earth. Oh! But meteorites can come from all sorts of places, sometimes from comets, and sometimes even from other planets. Meteorites are our best way of getting a hold of a piece of another world and looking at it close up. And the Natural History Museum has one of the finest collections anywhere in the world. Well, this is just fabulous. This is an enormous piece of Mars that fell to Earth in 2011. And that impact was observed. And so this is a fresh Martian meteorite kept in this case to keep it away from earthly contamination. And that means that it can tell us stories of the red planet. And this particular rock is the only Martian meteorite to show signs of water weathering it away in the dim and distant past on Mars. These are the latest images from our rovers on Mars, and their self-portraits show them hard at work on the surface of the red planet. But even though they're doing amazing science, nothing beats getting hold of a lump of Mars and bringing it down into the lab. 700,000 years ago, an impact on Mars resulted in debris being flung into space. What became the Tissant meteorite wandered through space before falling down to Earth, providing us with a hands-on guide to Mars's past. At the Natural History Museum, they're using medical CT scanning technology to build up an image of Tissant and its insides. They're looking for holes or voids inside the rock, which could be filled with Martian air. Well, this is a CT scan of a small fragment of Tissant that I um, looked at last year in the summer. Caroline Smith is the meteorite curator. And just to give you an idea, it's about the size of the end of my okay. little finger, so, so quite a, a small thing. Mars. And what we're seeing here is it's a video, a movie, as if we're sort of flying through the specimen. The CT scans revealed a hole in Tissant, which is filled with air. So the question is, if this has got air in it, is it Earth air or Martian air? Well, if, it, if it's completely sealed in the rock, theoretically it still should have Martian air in it. So that's what we wanted to find out. You can see it's completely sort of sealed at this end. Oh, but hang on, we've got all of this red stuff here, and in fact, there's a little hole. Oh no! Yeah. So okay. if there was any, if there was any Martian atmosphere in there, it ain't there now. We wouldn't have been able to do this a few years ago. With this, we can get a really good idea of what's inside the meteorite without having to chop it up, without having to cut it, without having to break it. Whenever you do those to any samples, but especially rare meteorites, of course, you're damaging something rare and precious. Meteorites are classified by their composition. Some are made of stone, but some are made of iron, the condensed cores of what must have been larger asteroids. Some are mixtures of both. The most interesting meteorites are relics of a time nearly five billion years ago, when our solar system was just forming. Out of the dust and debris left over from the birth of our sun, planets were eventually formed. But the details are sketchy, 
and what we need is first-hand evidence. We get just that in the form of meteorites called carbonaceous chondrites, the fossilized remains of the primeval solar system. So we're in the carbonaceous chondrite drawers, so you can see there's lots of different labels. What do they look like? How would we know well, one if it landed actually, in the back garden? Yeah, they're actually quite boring looking rocks, actually. <laughs> um, but that's the thing, they're, they're sort of lack of looking interesting belies their significance because they're actually some of the most interesting meteorites that we actually have to study. This is called Eendi. Now, why Eendi is very important is primarily because of these things. Now, you can see on the surface of this one, there's this white splodge. Yep. And then you can see inside as well, there's lots of sort of smaller, irregularly shaped white objects. Well, these are these things called CAIs. Stands for calcium aluminium rich inclusion. And the CAIs, we think, are the first solid objects to form in our solar system. Okay. So when we talk about the solar system being 4.6 billion years, it's, these things. it's actually dating the CAIs. And in fact, we think in the very, very early solar system, in the protoplanetary disk, that's where these rocks were beginning to form by bits and pieces all sticking together. Another reason sure. why carbonaceous chondrites are particularly interesting is some of them are very rich in organic molecules. Right, and there's, there's a story about this, isn't there? Is it the Murchison one? That's right. The Murchison's are one of my favourite meteorites, actually. And that means it's smelly, right? That's what I've heard, this anyway. This Murchison is smelly. Oh, yeah. You get yeah. a really strong gunpowder smell out of it's that. Quite, it's quite amazing. Yeah. So I'll try and... And that's been given off by the meteorite. This is being given off by the meteorite. Now, I'll sort of Pretty take it out. Hopefully no bits will drop off. Right. It's quite fragile. So this is a fairly large piece. Um, this yeah. one weighs about 800 grams. Okay. You can hold it but very carefully because it's it. quite friable. And you can see, again, a bit like END, quite a boring-looking meteorite, but it's very, very, very rich in organic molecules, amino acids, sugars, and perhaps the most interesting, I think, are nuclear bases, because nuclear bases are the organic molecules you need for DNA to... I was going to say, these are complicated these molecules. These are complicated so molecules. Asteroids and comets carry in them the building blocks of life, which then fall to Earth in meteorites. They have a sinister presence, emerging from the blackness and then disappearing silently again. They're dark, cratered worlds, scarred by impacts, most ancient, but some quite recent. Tracked by telescopes, we know precisely where the large ones are, but the vast majority of asteroids are too small for us to detect until the last minute. A fireball is the only sign that something's on the way. The last meteorite to fall in the UK was in 1991, and in that typically understated British way, it didn't make much of a fuss when it landed in Mr Pettifor's garden near Cambridge. They heard a whistling noise, and uh, the neighbour said, Arthur, I think something's just landed in your garden. And right at the back of the garden, um, they found this dark rock sitting where there had been no... So, dark rock, so we, and Mr the, Pettiford was clever enough to realise that this was something quite unusual and maybe this was a meteorite. You get lots of these calls from people who think they found e meteorites. A few hundred a year, So, yes. so when, when you go out to chase one of these up, the story sounds convincing, but, mm -hmm. but what do you look for in the rock? The first thing that's very characteristic is the very, very dark crust. Burnt is the wrong word, but... Well, it's, mel it's melted rock. It's called the fusion crust. So as this meteorite was hurtling through Earth's atmosphere, the rock actually melts. Yes, but only on the outside. But only on the outside. The inside never gets hot enough to melt. I'm going to give away a little secret here. One of the ways that we filter um, calls when people say, a meteorite landed in my garden last night, we always say to them, well, what happened? Was it hot when you picked it up? And as soon as they say, yes, it was boiling hot or it set the grass on fire or, you know, whatever. Then it's not a meteorite. Then it's not a meteorite because there are very few occasions, I should say, where meteorites have landed and somebody has picked them up almost immediately afterwards. They're described as being lukewarm. Well, this is the last British meteorite, but of course we've had the Russian meteorite in Chelyabinsk, right. which was very exciting. What do we know about that? 
The best guesstimate at the moment for the size of the object um, when it came into the Earth's atmosphere is about 17 metres wide. What sort of percentage survives to the ground? Well, it's difficult to say, but you might lose at least half the pre-atmospheric mass okay. and size thousands of stones have already been recovered and the largest one I think is about two kilograms. Is there scientific value in getting it so soon after an impact? Oh absolutely, absolutely. The, the less time a meteorite is sitting around on the ground for, the less it is being contaminated. More than a thousand meteorites fall to Earth every year. Caroline regularly goes meteorite hunting in the desert where conditions are ideal for preserving them. In 2010, in Australia, she found a funny little rock, which at first glance looked nothing special. Lucy's meeting up with Anton Kersley in the basement of the museum. He used his electron microscope to look at Caroline's find and was amazed at what he found. It was something incredibly rare, a meteorite from the moon. So this is an image of a cutaway of the meteorite magnified by a certain number of times. That's right. On the screen at the moment it's about 300 times magnification. Okay. On the picture over here you can see that the whole thing is just over a centimetre in size. It's about a fingernail size. Yeah. And uh, this is a really curious little area because there's a little dark grey patch with some little pale grey patches inside it. And when you start analysing the pale grey patches, these ones turn out to have a very interesting chemical composition. It turns out to be quite unlike the composition of things that we find on Earth. Okay. This is a little mineral, again, silicate mineral, but now it's got a lot of very strange elements in it. It's got zirconium and yttrium and titanium and iron and silicon. It's actually quite well known, but it's called tranquillityite. The Mare Tranquillitatis, one of the most famous features on the Moon and where man first stood. These precious meteorites give us clues about the Moon's ancient past and how it's changed, which is why finding them in pristine condition is so important. On Earth, deserts hot and cold are ideal for preserving these extraterrestrial rocks the Antarctic has become the new mecca for meteorite hunters. Since 1976, ANSMET, the US Antarctic Search for Meteorites programme, has retrieved 20,000 meteorites. Lunar scientist Katie Joy spent two months in Antarctica and her group managed to collect 63 meteorites, but they were hampered by the wind and temperatures of minus 25 degrees centigrade. Katie returned in January, and to remind her of her Antarctic experiences, we took her to a bar in central London, made completely of ice, and it was a balmy minus five degrees centigrade. So it's only minus five in here, it's minus 25 in Antarctica, oh, so this is easy. Uh, this is easy. <laughs> so Katie, why go to the extreme of visiting Antarctica to look for your meteorites? Antarctica is a desert. It has very little rainfall and precipitation, which means that the meteorites that are found there are very well preserved. Also, there are no trees, there are no buildings. It's very easy to find a nice big black meteorite <laughs> sitting on the white ice. So it's kind of an easy, easy thing to do. So this is a, a good example of a dark meteorite that would be sitting on the ice. Are there particularly good places to look for meteorites on Antarctica? There are. Meteorites fall randomly all over Antarctica as they do the rest of the world. But what happens is that the uh, ice on the polar plateau flows out towards the, towards the edge of the continent. And when it hits the mountain ranges, the ice is brought up to the surface. And so we find natural concentration sites, typically along the big mountain ranges, such as the Trans-Antarctic Mountains. It's cold enough being in here. Working in Antarctica must have been incredibly challenging. Tell me a bit about your experience. I was there for six weeks on the ice, very remote area. And every day we'd get up and if the weather was good enough, we would go out and search. And sometimes if you have a lot of snow or it's very windy, I mean, Antarctica is completely unpredictable. You get stuck in the tent, which is frustrating because <laughs> all you want to do is go out and find more meteorites. But um, it's hard work, but when you find them, it's a great reward. Antarctica is still a rich source of meteorites, with more science visits planned in the future. Every meteorite, it seems, has a story of its own. 
This is the largest meteorite in the museum's collection from Cranbourne in Australia. And at three and a half tons, it weighs the same as four cars. It's an impressive beast and it's older than the Earth. But we have some impressive meteorites in Britain too, and John has been on the trail of one of them. This one may have been carried along by a glacier, and it even attracted the interest of prehistoric man, but it was rediscovered sitting on someone's doorstep. This is the Iron Age hill fort at Barbary Castle near Swindon, first occupied some two and a half thousand years ago. What a wonderfully atmospheric, peaceful place this is. There's a real air of mystery around here. And all around you can see the remnants of the influence of ancient man, this Iron Age fort and burial mounds. And it brings to mind those stories of those Victorian amateur archeologists who used to love to explore and dig things up and whatever they found fascinating or just like the look of, they'd take home to their collections. This old photograph from country life in 1908 is of the Lake House Mansion in Wiltshire, once owned by the Reverend Edward Duke. He was known to excavate local burial grounds, keeping any interesting pieces for his own private collection. And on the doorstep is certainly something very interesting. It's the Lake House Meteorite. Here at the Salisbury and South Wiltshire Museum, I met up with Professor Colin Pillinger, he has become a meteorite detective, and he's been piecing together the history of the Lake House meteorite. Ah, well there it is. The Lake Again, House meteorite. You can't miss it, can you? It's a fair but, uh, size, isn't it? It's, uh, well, it's uh, 92 and a half kilograms. But this is not only the biggest British meteorite that we know about, it's also the one that has been longest on Earth, and it was when we made that measurement, which all of a sudden realised we had something quite exciting. So how old exactly is this meteorite and how long has it been on the Earth? It's technically 4.5, 4.6 billion years old. It's been on Earth 32,000 years. But to try and explain how it survived 32,000 years, you have to tease some facts out of it. 32,000 years ago on Salisbury Plain, the place was covered in ice. Now we're confident that we know meteorites survive very well in ice because we collect lots of meteorites on Antarctica. How do you explain the next bit? Bronze Age people living on Salisbury Plain sort of 4,000 years ago were building mounds to bury their important people. The, the meteorite was then put into one of these barrows. The majority of the rock that they used would have been chalk. And you have these lovely pictures of the meteorite on the steppe where you see the patches of chalk still on the meteorite. So it clearly was packed somewhere where closely associated with chalk. Colin believes that after it was dug up, the meteorite must have been kept inside, protected, in Edward Duke's collection. But after his death, it was demoted to the doorstep, possibly used for kicking off mud from gentlemen's boots. Since then, the chalk has washed off, and you look at the meteorite now, and there's no chalk there. So it can't have been out on that step for more than about 100 years. So the story goes, 32,000 years ago, a meteorite fell in Britain and was preserved in a glacier, then used by Bronze Age man to build his burial mound and dug up by a Victorian archeologist. Using a series of clues, Colin has revealed an extraordinary tale about an extraordinary meteorite. A wonderful piece of serendipity. The needle left the haystack and made its way to you. Absolutely. Science is a lot of serendipity. Yeah. Such so good fun. We hope that serendipity will play a part tonight. We're back at Barbary Castle to look for Comet Pan Stars, which we hope to see in a couple of hours. Pete, Paul and Chris North are here too. The sky is fairly clear and we are hopeful, but this comet is low down and very faint. We're joined by the Wiltshire Astronomical Society to look for it. And last night, member Pete Glastonbury saw the comet and what a bonny comet it is too. Let's hope we'll be as lucky tonight. 
Well, we're waiting for uh, the uh, the darkness to fall, and we, when we first arrived, it was awful, wasn't it? It was, and it has cleared, I have to say. It has. We're extremely and, lucky. I mean, this is rare on a Sky at Night shoot. <laughs> we're also joined by some of our beginner astronomers, Peter and Steve Bosley, and Christina Chester. They've come to pick up some tips about observing Saturn, which is in our April night sky, rising around 10 p.m. at the beginning of the month and getting earlier as the month goes on. Have you ever seen Saturn through your no, telescope? No, just Jupiter. Right, OK, well, you're in for a real treat with Saturn because it is a, it's a stunner. That's, that's the planet which actually hooked me into astronomy. How do you find Saturn? <laughs> OK, well, you know what the plough looks like. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know the handle of the plough. If you follow the curve of that away from the, the blade bit, if you like, or if you carry on the curve round, it comes to Spica, which is the brightest star in Virgo, and Saturn is off to the lower left of Spica, and it's about the same brightness. Do you reckon we're going to see the comet tonight? Fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see your fingers crossed in those gloves, but I'll trust you. So the reason why Saturn is so good to look at in April is because it's at opposition. And when a planet's at opposition, then this is the best time to look at it. So we thought we'd do a little demonstration to demonstrate the opposition. Okay. Uh, you're going to be the sun. So the Peter, sun. Peter, you'll be the sun. Uh, Steve, you can yep. be the Earth. Can I ask you to stand here, please? Yeah, of course. Okay, so there we are. You're the planet Earth. There we go. And I'm the, I should represent Saturn, a ringless Saturn, needless to say, that would be Saturn. So this is what this is opposition. It is when the Sun and the planet in question are in opposite sides of the uh, opposite sides of the Earth. So we have the Sun in one part of the sky, and in the opposite direction of the sky, we have the planet Saturn. How many moons does? Saturn. It's got loads of moons, but there are uh, most of them are too faint to be seen with a small telescope. But there is a good family of them that go round the planet itself, more than you'd see with Jupiter. Um, so they're, they're always in attendance and they're really worth looking out for as well. The darkness and the cold is enveloping us, but this Iron Age fort feels really quite magical. OK, so we've got Neil and Hilary here, and you're locals, aren't you? Yes, we're from Devizes. Have you had any look at finding the comet? No, we haven't, so we're hopeful that we'll see it tonight. I think we're all hopeful. Kids, what do you, what, what do you guys get I out like of it? planets and space stations and stuff. Planets are good. Yeah, I like seeing all the galaxies and the stars and things. Yeah. I think the comet is currently hiding in a bank of cloud and comets are really delicate things in the night sky so when you get any haze, especially in a bright sky like we've got now, it just washes them out completely. It's like a comet filter. While we wait in hope for the stubborn clouds to clear from the horizon, it's time for our space surgery. Well, now the first in a new feature on the sky at night, and it is our space surgery, where we shall do our very best to answer the astronomical questions that you may have. And our first question comes from Mary Pont of Cambridgeshire. And Mary lives in a bungalow, uh, quite low down. She hasn't got a telescope, just her own eyes and a pair of 750 binoculars. So is there anything that she can look for? Well... Uh, the best thing to do, Mary, is to find your way around the rest of the sky, so get yourself a night sky guide, perhaps. Mary's binoculars are not too dissimilar to the ones I'm holding here. They're great for hunting for star clusters, and there's a few examples of that. Uh, one of the ones that is a chart for on our website is uh, M44, the Beehive Cluster, or Prosapi. It's a really great place to start. It's fabulous in a pair of binoculars like these. Now this next question, this is a great one, and I used to wonder this uh, when I was a lad. Why are planets, stars and moons perfectly round? And are there any that are not? So asks Lawrence Harrop of Eccles. Well, it's, it's a, it is a very good question, and, and the answer, quite simply, is, is gravity. So once a rocky object, which is what planets, moons and asteroids and so on are made of, gets more than a few hundred kilometres across in, in, in diameter, then its own self-gravity, its own gravitational pull, its own mass, will pull everything into pretty much a round sphere. A great example is some of Saturn's moons. So it's bigger moons such as Rhea and Titan and Enceladus and nice round bodies. But some of the smaller ones such as Prometheus and, and Pandora are much uh, more odd shaped because they're too small for gravity to have pulled them. Uh, next question is from another Chris, uh, Chris Fordham in Huddersfield. Uh, my question, as our galaxy is so vast, 
Is there a simple way to tell when looking at stars if they are outside our Milky Way? The simple answer is that all the stars you can see are inside our own galaxy. Measuring distance to objects in astronomy has always been a, a challenge. Uh, there were various ways of doing it, and in fact there was a, a result out that we've just measured the distance to the, one of the nearest galaxies, the Large Magellanic Cloud, through knowing the properties of those stars in the galaxy themselves, and by determining those, measure the distance to that of 163,000 light years to an accuracy of, of one part in 50. So we're getting much better at measuring distances to, to stars in other galaxies. But it's actually something that in astronomy is, is very hard to do. Uh, if you have a question, we will do our best to answer it. So uh, send it to us at bbc.co.uk forward slash sky at night. Well, we didn't actually get to see the comet in the end, did we, chaps? No, we didn't. But not to worry. <laughs> we have a beautiful clear night here, though, don't we? It's, so it's not the last chance to find it, right? Oh, no. Comet C2011 L4 Pan stars it will be in our skies for some time yet. It's getting fainter as time goes on, but throughout the month of April, it'll pass up through Andromeda, through Cassiopeia, towards Cepheus, um, and it actually goes quite close to the Andromeda galaxy That's as well. That's a nice picture, so a good, isn't it? A good opportunity to, uh, to pick out the comet still throughout the month of April. Sadly, it eluded us. That bank of cloud was like two pub bouncers saying, you're not coming in. <laughs> and, um... Well, we may have been unlucky, but not so for many of you. Our Flickr site has some amazing images of the comets from around the world. You can see the best of them on our website at bbc.co.uk slash skyatnight. We have one more celestial treat. Lucy and Chris have been allowed to hold something rather precious. Well, this is something really special. This is a piece of Martian meteorite. And so this little rock knew Mars when it was a wet world, travelled out into space, and then ended up here on Earth where it can tell us its story. And I'm holding the piece of the moon that Anton showed me earlier on. Trapped in this tiny fragment is the history of the lunar surface from that area. A huge thank you to the Natural History Museum for showing us behind the scenes and allowing us to hold these very special objects. And so when we come back next month, we'll be going past the moon, past Mars and on out to Saturn. So until next month, good, good night. night.